I'm Carla Millette. I'm director of the Center for European Studies. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I wanted to make um, a quick announcement. Our um, This is our last lecture of the semester, but our last event of the semester will happen on um, Wednesday, April 18th. This is the day after the last day of classes when we have our uh, end of semester program. Uh, this The theme this semester is Jewish music in the time of the Holocaust, and we're going to have um, uh, performers, in fact. Um, yeah, Natasha, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Is there a talk at the end of semester luncheon or is it just music? Okay, lecture and recital, okay, thank you. <laughs> so there you go, that's coming up. Um, and I also wanted to, to um, make an announcement about Gregor Metzen's talk next week in Earwig, uh, the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, on April 11th at noon at 2239 Lane Hall. This is going to be a talk on the title uh, of uh, Identity Work and the Interviewer, Prostitution, Feminists, and Ambivalence, which sounds really fascinating. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Greer Matson investigates the public regulation of private pleasures. Uh, he's especially interested in how communities try to control sexuality and alcohol. He's working on a book about what he's been doing here this year. In fact, he's working on a book on recent European conflicts over uh, prostitution regulation. Um, this research was funded in part by a Fulbright scholarship to the European Union and a National Science Foundation Graduate Fe Research Fellowship. His um, work as preliminary research has appeared in um, journals like City and Community, Contexts, and the Annual Review of Sociology. He He's also interested in Finnish nationalism um, and in the development of ethnography as a research method. And I think that that talk next week is part of a self-reflection on, uh, um, on research methods in sociology and ethnography. He has spent this year as the 2011-2012 um, Oakham Visiting Assistant Professor. That's Oberlin Kalamazoo and University of Michigan Visiting Assistant Professor in Sociology and Women's Studies. Um, the title of his talk today is Prostitution Reform uh, as a Symptom of EU Integration Anxieties. Please join me in welcoming Gregor Matson. So the talk I'm gonna give today is a chapter that I'm developing and I really welcome any counterfactuals you have because the case I'm making today, it's circumstantial. It's, it's by inference, so I'm hoping to convince you um, so don't be seduced along with my words. Help me um, sort of refine this argument before it comes out in, in print. So the, the puzzle that I'm dealing with today is to explain the timing of these, this spate of national prostitution reform debates that happened in the European Union between 1998 and 2004. This is a puzzle because European countries has re had really been deregulating sex, getting out of the sex regulation business since the 1970s. Um, so why they would decide to get back in the market of regulating prostitution is a puzzle. Um, for social scientists, I think this was kind of a disturbing puzzle because there had been changes on the ground. The markets in sex had changed in 1990 with the fall of the Iron Curtain and the resumption of migration from Eastern Europe to Western Europe. But that situation had stabilized by 1991 or 92, and the legislation didn't happen then. So we have to explain the timing of this reform debates. And the social scientists kept saying in 1997 and 98, 99, that nothing's new, nothing's new, there's no problem, and the politicians thought there was a problem. And so there's this conflict between you know, how does social science produce knowledge that affects political debates, or can they? This puzzle also weighs in on the European Union, for me, is a really good case of if we're going to worry about our states relevant anymore and have supranational forces taken on many of the functions of the state, the EU is the strongest case, because here we have states that more or less democratically have chosen to give up much of their sovereignty to a supranational organization. So if we're gonna look for a case of where states shouldn't be relevant anymore, the EU should be that location. And the last puzzle uh, maybe is more for me, but these reforms 
had been described by social scientists as examples of a sex panic or moral panic. That these were examples of European politicians being worried about nothing. And I don't think that's a very good, I don't think it's a good mechanism and I don't think it's a good explanation. And what I'm going to show you today is that panic or no, there was a lot of infrastructure involved in motivating this debate and shaping how that it played out. So the research that I'm talking about today, it's based on 120 interviews that I did with policymakers, officials who shaped the debates, or people who were in charge of administering these new policies that were enacted. And I did these interviews uh, in five countries, the Netherlands, Sweden, Finland, and Germany. And then I also spent a year in Brussels working on the European Union side of things. Uh, so in conjunction with these interviews, I also collected media debates from the national newspapers of all of these four countries and have done policy analyses of policies from the European Commission, the European Council, and the European Parliament. So this is a multi-method project based on texts and these interviews that I conducted. So when we talk about regulating prostitution, there, there's four policy types that I'm going to end up talking about that were being debated about in law de jure. So criminalization is when prostitution is forbidden by law and we arrest the seller of sex and usually also the buyers, though never quite as often. That's the situation in the US in 49 states except for Nevada. Um, none of the EU countries have criminalized prostitution since the 1970s, early 70s. The second policy management regime is decriminalization. So the state doesn't take an interest, it's sort of left up to the market how prostitution is going to occur. This happened last week in Canada, if anyone noticed the news story that the courts in Ottawa struck down um, Canada's prostitution regulations, and so now prostitution has been de facto decriminalized. But for us, I think it's useful to think about adultery is something that was decriminalized in the U.S. in the 1970s, and I think the last state did it in 1982. So before then, local prosecutors could prosecute cases of adultery even without a complainant. But once it was decriminalized, then it just becomes a civil matter. Abolition is the third policy type, and these are laws designed to get rid of prostitution altogether, and usually they attempt this through two, sort of the left hand of the state and the right hand of the state. The right hand of the state is going to punish the buyers of sex, and especially crack down on pimping, human trafficking, um, advertising, and the buyers. And the left hand of the state is going to provide social welfare provisions to help, um, help people out of prostitution. And the last is legalization. And legalization is control, uh, state control of the market. So I think the best way to think about it in the US is alcohol. It's heavily regulated, it's legal. Um, but it's not a, it, there's a big difference between, say, decriminalization and legalization. And it's not a distinction we often make in the United States. Before I go on, does anyone have any quick questions about the distinctions here? Are you going to let us know what the, the policy is in the countries where you did these? Okay. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. Also, do you know what that German is? Like? Yes, it says the secrets of love. <laughs> but it's underneath a, a police sign so for me it was it was a perfect yeah it's a dish it's it's a build report on uh, it was the dumbest article it was it was basically hormones rule women's passions and if men really want to know how women work they need to understand their hormones <laughs> very unsociological so between 1972 and 1998 there was stability and consensus in european countries about how to regulate prostitution in 14 of the 15 european union countries in 1998 prostitution was decriminalized in the law books of course on the ground de facto 
there was a huge amount of diversity in what kinds of prostitution were permitted and it was controlled at the local level. So in a sense, prostitution was really local, local control under this regime. So we can think about an example in the Netherlands where Amsterdam, everyone thought it was legal. It looked like it was legal, but that's actually, it was a compromise that was worked out at the local level. It was technically illegal, but the national government allowed Amsterdam to control it is, its way. And similarly, in the more Catholic countries of the Eastern Netherlands that didn't want to have prostitution at all, they were allowed to do it their way. So it, this stability and consensus really accommodated a huge amount of diversity within countries and between countries. Only Austria had national uh, brothel legalization, very similar to um, Nevada, actually. Individual provinces could decide whether or not bordellos would be permitted. Suddenly in 1998, though, there were parliamentary debates about changing prostitution law, and these were interesting for two reasons. One was, in all of these debates, they were essentially rationalizing prostitution, picking one definition of what prostitution was going to be and imposing that across the rest of the country. So it was also uh, an example of nationalizing prostitution, in a sense. As you can see here, the poli policy regimes were really divided. So several countries were debating whether to legalize prostitution or not. And in the end, Germany and the Netherlands did legalize prostitution. Several other countries were debating whether to abolish prostitution altogether, France, Ireland, Sweden, and Finland. In the end, only Sweden and Finland tri uh, enacted abolitionist policies. Good Europeans, the Danes, Belgians, and the Scottish Parliament had both proposals on the table at the same time. Uh, Belgium ended up legalizing prostitution, Denmark did nothing, and Scotland did nothing. And then the only country that didn't have a debate was Portugal. So in this sort of limited time frame, it, prostitution really was the hot topic in parliaments. So in order to make the case that I'm making today, this sort of circumstantial case, I'm going to tackle it in three steps to try to demonstrate that this wave of reforms was a symptom of the European Union and anxieties about what integration was going to mean. First, I'm going to tackle the timing of the debates. Second, I'm going to tackle how they spread from country to country. And then third, we're going to look at what was the content or the logic of the debates. So, the context. It's hard to remember now, but once upon a time, the EU was going to take over the world, the US was going to lose hegemony, and Europe was going to run the 21st century. These were the books that you could buy in any airport bookstore in any European airport in the middle of the 2000s. The timeline here is, is important because this timeline is tracking how the European Union, as it became known, went from being purely an economic um, entity that was designing a common market and how it came to appropriate new powers of justice and policing and then social policy. And it's actually precisely in this later time uh, starting in 1997, that social policies that prostitution would be part of first made it onto the European Union plate. In 1993, the Maastricht Treaty that first founded the European Union added this third pillar of justice and home affairs. So for the first time now, in addition to the market, now the EU says we'd really like to coordinate our laws and our migration policy and asylum seeking, but we don't have that authority, so we're going to set up this body that's going to be mutually consultative, but we really can't control it, but we're really going to try. And that was this third pillar entity. In 1995, the EU expanded to take in Finland and Sweden and Austria, and this new social dimension was debuted. And suddenly we were going to start to um, discuss how are we going to harmonize the welfare policies of all of these different countries. And 
in the national Swedish debate, they were going to try to Swedify Europe. And this is going to become relevant later. In 1997, we have this Treaty of Amsterdam that now takes migration into the European community role. So it, now it is functionally part of the European Union, and now it's been recognized as part of the common market. And th this will become relevant too. As soon as the Treaty of Amsterdam comes into force, these debates start breaking out all over Europe. As the Europe, European currency is launched, optimism about Europe is growing. All between 2000 and 2004 is when these books come out and the EU expands to 25 members and it seems like, you know, the, the future is European. And then the EU constitution fails in 2005, and now the bookshelves in the, Euro in the airports change, <laughs> and now Europe is over. In 2006, in part because it takes the European Parliament so long to do anything, um, they finally have hearings and debate what position the Parliament should take on prostitution in, at the beginning of 2006. It had been put on the table sometime in 2005 or 2004, but guess what? There is no European Parliament position. <laughs> they can't come to any consensus. And between 2005 and 2011, there are no more national parliamentary debates until this year. And now France is back at it, but quiet. So at least timing-wise, the timing of these debates tracks on to the time when the European Union takes on migration and takes on social policies, that suddenly that's when prostitution comes on the agenda, on all of these diverse national agendas. So how did this debate spread, or how did it become such a, such a hot topic at the supranational field? And in part, I'm blaming the EU because it created these elite policy networks. So if you can bear with, my, bear with the acronyms. You know, they used to say it was the Works Progress Administration during the New Deal that invented so many acronyms, but the EU has put us all to shame. The European Commission is in charge of the common market. They created institutions that brought national policymakers about prostitution into contact with each other, many of them for the first time, but they had to meet with each other four to six times a year. These were the people who I was interviewing. They came either to be close colleagues or to despise each other, and they had to keep seeing each other over and over. So the commission in 1998 appoints national rapporteurs, which is just a nice way of saying point people, each country had to appoint a point person on human trafficking. Separately, we have a network of experts. Third, they fund programs to fund non-governmental organizations. So the common market is going to fund nonprofits to stop human trafficking, help <laughs> migrant prostitutes not spread HIV, and um, stop human trafficking and stop HIV together. So under the common market, a network of people are brought together. Under the justice and home affairs, a lot of the civil servants from around the European Union are brought together. So Europol is bringing um, police forces, national police forces into contact with each other to share expertise. Eurojust is bringing the prosecutors all across Europe together. There's a police chief's, chief's task force that then got into the policy making about prostitution and human trafficking. And in 2004, the uh, common border security agency is launched, Frontex. So it's our um, ICE, basically. And this is another place where people are drawn together from across Europe, from these different policy positions. The third place where this is happening is these external agencies like the United Nations, the International Organization of Migration, and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. All of these organizations themselves have anti-trafficking organizations, prostitution think tanks, 
And what's unique about these is they're drawing from the same pool of people. There's only a limited number of experts in each country, especially if you're thinking about a country like Finland that only has 5 million people. Or as we expand the EU to 25, you have Malta. You know, there's only 100,000 people. So it's not surprising that the founders of the NGOs are also the police chiefs who are then sent to the United Nations to help negotiate. And so many of these people are actually the same people. And by being brought together, they're the ones who go back to their national parliaments and start telling them, hey, if the EU starts taking on social policy, we might get stuck with the Swedish policy, or we might get stuck with the Dutch policy. So this is where this contagion starts to spread through the different parliaments. This civil society funding um, segment is really interesting. These are the organizations that receive this nonprofit funding from the European Commission. And they became the incubators for a lot of the policy experts because these started out invariably as local city-based organizations, women's health clinics. TAMPEP had started as women's, a network of women's health clinics that then grew into a project to help migrant prostitutes. Um, the European Women's Lobby is, had started as kind of a gentlewoman's umbrella organization of all women's organizations in Europe. So, you know, the auxil ladies' auxiliaries of different organizations, all of them used to send representatives to the European Women's Lobby. Then it became more of a political lobby organization in the 1980s, a la um, the National Organization of Women. And then the Stop Trafficking Project began giving out funds to any organization that wanted to stop trafficking. They gave out quite a lot of money over time. What's interesting about these organizations then is if you were an, or if you were an organization inside the Netherlands and you're hearing the parliamentary debates that they're going to legalize prostitution and you really hate this, you're cut off from funds from the Dutch government because they're not going to give out money to your, say, Catholic organization that opposes prostitution altogether. But you can get it from these programs. The European Women's Lobby only funds abolitionist programs. TAMPAP only funds um, legalization programs. Daphne prefers to fund abolitionist programs, but as I found, people were very creative about the way they use their money. Um, and Stop tra Trafficking only funds abolition. So these civil society um, programs of the European Union were really funding the domestic opposition in each of these countries. So if the, the people weren't, organizations say in Finland that really wanted Finland to legalize prostitution, they weren't so unhappy because they did have funds to continue their missions, despite the fact that the national political arg uh, argument had sort of moved against them. To give you an example of the way that this policy field sort of would come together, I'll give you an example of Kaisa Valberry, who she had started out as, um, she worked for the Swedish FBI, essentially. She got appointed to be the Swedish national rapporteur. And when she first got appointed, she said, Really, I thought this was a horrible waste of time, just new meetings I would have to go to. Really, Sweden has no problem with prostitution. But I was naive. I had no idea the depth of the problem, and now it is my job to educate others. As the National Rap Rapporteur, she then became the chair of the European Police Chief Task Force, and now she's the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. She is the point person for human trafficking for the whole organization. So she has moved sort of from the third pillar to the first, to the external agencies. Another example is Sandra Claussen, who is now, or 
I guess was in, in 2003, she was the director of TAMPEP. She had started at a local um, Rotterdam NGO helping migrant prostitutes access services like condoms and legal protection. She became the TAMPEP national director. She also has been tasked to do trainings for Frontex because they need to know how do we detect migrant prostitutes and provide them with services. And she since has gone on to the International Organization of Migration. So this circulation of people has taken them from this national context into international spheres that agree with their policies. And there's these sort of vertical career tracks for each of the policy regimes except criminalization within the European Union. And then the logic of the debates is, I think, the last circumstantial evidence I can present to say that it really was the European Union that was doing this. So within the debates that, was, that were being held in the countries where I was doing my interviews. These legislative proposals were framed around national citizenship and they were about domestic prostitutes. So in the way that I can interpret these debates as being actually quite similar, despite the fact that the policies were quite opposite, is politicians were saying, our prostitutes, our German prostitutes, have not been getting the full German citizenship. They haven't been getting the health care that they have been paying into, if they've been paying into it. And if they haven't, they should be paying into it. They also don't get pensions. So we have poverty among German citizens. And so we need to do our part as Germans to extend German citizenship to all. Similarly, in Sweden, where citizenship is Gender equality is uh, one of the pillars of the Swedish welfare state. And so the debates went something like, Swedish prostitutes are not gender equal, and the state has been doing nothing about it. So they have been left out of the equality that is their right as Swedish women. And it is our job in 1999 to finally extend full citizenship to Swedish prostitutes. In both cases, pensions and health care for workers in the Netherlands or Germany, or in Finland and Sweden, gender equality, where prostitution is always violence against women, on the other hand, were framed as eternal principles that were outside the realm of politics. So one of the drafters of the Swedish legislation, who then herself went on to this transnational sphere, said, when I first got involved, the politics they were horrible. When I came into this policy area four or five years ago, I was shocked, really. I wonder if it had to do the fact is that prostitution really is the most extreme outcome of unequal gender relations, and it's so loaded. And the way that other people deal with it is so moralistic. So in her description, to disagree with the statement that it's the most extreme form of gender relations is to take a moralistic position or a political one. And the taken for granted consensus among Swedes is the objective, um, I mean, obviously it's a moral position, it's not an amoral position, but it's just, it's, that's just a statement of fact, and everyone else is sort of emotionally messed up. Similar in Germany, the director of the Berlin Vice Unit, uh, a self described radical feminist, says, I would like to eliminate all prostitution, but I am well aware that I cannot abolish it altogether. I can fight it, we can fight it together, we can show the facilitators and the people who do prostitution that we have muscles, we will break you, you had better watch out. But sometimes I have the feeling that we are fighting windmills. We can never get every woman out of prostitution, and the best we can do is to get each woman away from her tormentors so that other women will not be tormented. So there, a woman who probably in a Swedish context would agree with the abolitionist position has more of a pragmatic attitude that as much as she would like to achieve abolishing prostitution, she knows that the best she can do as a police chief is to help each individual woman who wants help. So 
My second piece of circumstantial evidence that this really isn't just about changes in prostitution is that the, the European Union starts to get worried that really this social policy that they've embarked upon, it might mess up the common market. So the European Commission has this, I don't know, nabobs who are in charge of issuing policy papers about anything that might damage the market. And in 2002, they come out with this, I can't find the quote. They come out with alarm that you know, hey, if Sweden and, and the Netherlands are going to be adopting these opposing policies, it then allows them to have trade wars with each other because they can ban each other's products if it's part of something that's just national domestic policy of the welfare state because that's out of the European Union's purview. So by the national governments framing this as part of domestic welfare, the EU has no control and national concerns trump the market when it comes to those particular cases. So the ways that these prostitution regulations had been passed could potentially have allowed those two countries to engage in trade sanctions against each other, which... Well, how would that work? Article 95. I mean, oh. So I think, for example, if if books are being sold that are advocating prostitution, then Sweden can ban them. And if a common member state bans something, you can ban something of theirs as a tit for tat. So, I don't know. Okay, yeah, Denmark or the Netherlands will ban Swedish fish, yes. <laughs> and now suddenly we have a full on trade war. Um, <laughs> They were very worried about pornography. Like, that, it, that is a big, very touchy thing, and I don't know enough about it, but the domestic production of pornography and its transmission about borders is another area that this report said is, we had better tread carefully here. <laughs> a third place in which the logic of debates, the logic of the debates, reveals that the EU was really the driving force is in each of these national contexts, the people actually in charge of dealing with prostitutes on a day-to-day -day basis, they all opposed the legislative changes. Even despite their own personal beliefs, the police chief, the police officers, the social workers, the women's health clinic, the neighborhood activists, they all said, we don't want the national government involved. We don't want the EU involved. It just gets messed up. We would prefer this local control, this older, the way that we were doing it before was working okay. It's, it's not broke. Don't fix it. So, so they opposed policy changes in both directions. Yes. In even if both liberalization and regulation. Absolutely. Even when you'd have someone say, I run this women's health clinic, of course prostitution should be outlawed. But I don't want a law to do that. Because once it goes to the national level or to the EU level, we have no more control. We have worked out a relationship with our local police chief, our local um, director of migration at the local asylum center, and so we get to serve the women we need to serve, and they don't come and raid us, and we have a a deal. Um, and the, the last sort of piece of the, of the logic is, so what happened to these debates after 2005? They got absorbed into debates about human trafficking. And human trafficking has largely replaced these because it's something that nobody is in favor of. So, the Netherlands and the German, and in the Netherlands and Germany, they're against human trafficking. They've signed the European Convention Against Human Trafficking. And when they have an illegal foreign worker, they deport her because she's working illegally in a place where prostitution is legal. In Sweden and Finland, when they find a victim of human trafficking, they repatriate her 
to her family who are best able to care for her in her time of need. And in both cases, they receive EU funds to help deal with the monitoring and making sure that as the women are returned or are sent back that they don't fall into the hands of human traffickers. But in a sense, these human trafficking funds have become a form of m migration management when it comes to single women. And human trafficking has been the source of these funds. Also, these local individual nonprofits, they don't oppose human trafficking either even though they, like the social scientists, are often skeptical of the stories that are used to justify the, the legislation, because human trafficking generates an incredible amount of money. Funding for prostitution projects increased 20-fold between 1998 and 2004, and the funding has increased more slowly after that, but human trafficking has sort of maintained this increase in funding from 2005 to 2011. And as long as the money is going around, I don't think that anyone is, is in any sense to uh, oppose this. And the EU is sort of lubricating this by keeping the funds flowing. So this Daphne project, which once started as a temporary project, it was renewed, and now it's a permanent part of the European Commission. And it's held within um, one of the directorates gender, general. Daphne comes from Ovid. I had to go look it up. All of these, um, all these European programs get names like Erasmus for the student exchange. Leonardo brings together engineers across Europe. Daphne stops human trafficking. Daphne was a nymph who her whole life wanted to remain a virgin. And Apollo is shot by an arrow from Cupid, from Eros, and he's so inflamed with lust, and he's chasing after Daphne, who calls to her father, the river god, to deliver her and preserve her virginity. And so her father, the river god, hears her plea and turns her into a laurel tree. And I think that actually, without meaning it, the, the Daphne parable helps describe what is the purpose of a lot of these prostitution debates that the European Union was having, is that they were about rooting women, whether they be our national domestic women or those foreign women need to stay rooted in their own place. And they really, it, yeah, I don't know if they were, I don't want to say that the policies were trying to ensure domestic virginity, but they certainly were, um, had very reductive understandings of, of what prostitution was. So to wrap up, or to sort of summarize, if we're going to think about why do states engage in, in cultural debates and why they take up issues, my fellow social scientists have to get beyond um, this um, moral panic, sex panic, I think, because the infrastructure that these have, the amount of institutions set up by the European Union that conveyed these debates and transmitted them and then sustained them in the course of decades, doesn't describe a panic. And if the publics in each of these countries quickly lost interest in prostitution once the European constitution failed, the organizational logics of these funding agencies has, has sustained themselves and their budgets have only increased. And organizationally, we know it's, it's, it's hard to kill a bureaucracy. And it's certainly, as long as our concern about human trafficking endures, then it's impossible for any politician to ever cut funds for human trafficking because, as we know, it is the most extreme form of slavery on earth. Who can argue with that? What's interesting about this case is here we have these European states that had voluntarily given up sovereignty to a supranational entity, but in the case of these prostitution reforms, they were doing an end run around European sovereignty, this idea there was gonna be a European citizenship, and they were really reworking their national citizenships in ways that distinguished themselves from each other 
by legalizing prostitution and working it into your German or your Dutch welfare state, you were saying to be a Dutch citizen or to be a German citizen is to not be Swedish. These are almost mutually exclusive categories. I think for the social scientists, we have to understand that our discourse of empirical truth, it's only one among many, and I myself am kind of skeptical that we really have that much influence because the people who listen to us are the ones who already believed us to begin with. So right now, my discipline of sociology is in this fad of public sociology where we're all supposed to put our work out there. And, you know, the social scientists in Europe all through the late 90s and the early 2000s kept saying prostitution isn't that problem. In Sweden, we don't really have that much prostitution. In Finland, as far as the social scientists were concerned, there were about 20 women on the street in one neighborhood of one city. And that was what had provoked this national debate. And once they moved indoors, the debate ended. So the Finnish social scientists kept saying, this, it's not a problem, it's only 20 women, it's only 20 women, and nobody listened. And I think that as sociologists, we sort of have to come to terms with, we're not gonna have the, the, the truth of empiricism isn't always going to be heard. And I think the last is that this interest in human trafficking that we have, that we're sort of in the middle of, it's really gonna be here to stay for quite a while. We rediscovered it in the late 90s. It's a continuation of debates we had in the late 20th, in the late 19th century. And with the kind of organizational infrastructure that's built up, I think that um, no matter what the social scientists say, um, we're gonna keep funding it. So I welcome your questions.